Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Interreg Europe webinar on green transition under the European Recovery and Resilience Facility. My name is Astrid Severin, and I'm a thematic expert for environment and resource efficiency at the Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform. I will be moderating this webinar today together with my colleague Katharina Krell. Let's start, however, with some little housekeeping. Please note that this webinar is being recorded so that we can broadcast it at a later stage. Please also note that you are muted, but we encourage you, of course, to ask questions to the chat. And we will be distributing the presentations that we're making today uh, to you at a later stage, so you can read them quietly at your own ease. I would also like to introduce my colleagues from the Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform that are involved in the organization of today's webinar. So colleagues, please turn on your cameras. We're having uh, Thorsten Kohlisch, the manager of the Policy Learning Platform. Hello. Katharina Krell, thematic manager, uh, thematic expert, low carbon economy. Simon Hanken, thematic expert, low carbon economy, who is going to take care of your questions today. Marco Citelli, who is thematic expert for environment and resource efficiency and our rapporteur. And I'm also very pleased to have, of course, Lotte van Meijel, our web expert, who is the most important person <laughs> so that everything goes well. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to give the word to Thorsten Kohlisch first, who to briefly introduce the policy learning platform, the work that we are doing, and also how you can benefit from our services. Thorsten, please, the word is yours. Mike. Oh, the standard mistake. Still, after one year of online meetings, uh, still the same mistake. No, very welcome also from my side. Astrid, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Full screen mode, please. Voila. OK. Of course, we live in exceptional times, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are all experienced that every day. Um, and everybody is working on solutions. Solution is a buzzword. I will only say two words about Interreg Europe, the policy learning platform, just to uh, provide the context for today's webinar, which is about green transition and the new funding opportunities offered by the ERRF. But again, two words about Interreg Europe and the policy learning platform. Most of you may know Interreg Europe is about local and regional policies, making sure that those, the practitioners, the policymakers, those working with local and regional development policies do not work in isolation. We have many good solutions, good practices, experience out there in Europe, in our regions, our cities, and with our program, our platform, we want to make sure that people connect learn from each other, share their good and bad experiences, make sure that all of us, that we do not have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, this has been uh, the business of Interreg Europe for many years through EU-funded cooperation projects. And with the policy learning platform, we want to complement the work done by the projects. I mean, nearly 260 projects, nearly all European regions involved, more than 2,000 partners. And we want to make sure that all this work done by the projects, all their good practices, their solutions, are made available for all cities and regions in Europe, whether they are involved in projects or not. And furthermore, we want to make sure that whenever you have the need or you see an added value in exchanging with others, we provide you the possibilities, the platform in doing so. Of course, now more than ever, we offer online uh, learning possibilities. Networking is naturally at the heart of our business. And last but not least, we also dive deeper. We provide personalized policy advice to the uh, challenges and questions you have on your desks. But let me say two words about the online learning possibilities. Well, you are experiencing one of our webinars. They are organized on a regular basis. We have, of course, in times of the pandemic, an intensified rhythm. So my colleagues, Katharina, Astrid, Marco, working hard 
you see some of the recently organized webinars here on this slide, just to mention that they are available for replay on our website, interreg.europe.eu, and then you click on Policy Learning Platform. Also very inspiring, the many good practices uploaded, presented by European cities and regions. They are validated by our colleagues. They provide concrete evidence of success. I have to say really inspiring to read them. And I think some of them we will also feature today. And they also feed into the written work done by our experts, the policy briefs. Again, here some appetizers for you to dive deeper. And the same holds true for our policy digest, our thematic newsletters, which allow you to stay updated on the latest thematic developments. Now, uh, two words about our personalized policy advice. What is the difference? Basically, we listen to you, the questions, the challenges you are facing. So in very simple words, you can drop us a line, write an email, call us, and you will get comprehensive advice from our experts, of course, also with references to recently organized webinars, to policy briefs, good practices, or literally you can put your questions on the table. And we will organize a matchmaking session, matchmaking meeting for you. So we, based on the questions you raise, the challenges you are facing with our colleagues, we will identify two, three or four suitable peers or practitioners from Europe who can share their experiences and expertise with you. And of course, this, uh, this uh, format is highly suited for online exchange. Therefore, do not hesitate to contact us. And the peer reviews, they follow the same logic, but we dive even deeper. We do not spend 90 minutes, but we spend, we spend two full days on the challenges you are facing at your door, doorstep. Till early 2020, we used to organize them on site in the host region, the region um, submitting the request. Uh, since then, we have been organizing the peer reviews online. I have also seen some names in the list of participants, uh, previous peers or hosts. And I'm glad to say, truly glad to say that so far the feedback has been very positive. The tool is working very well, also online. You see, I'm also glad that we have indeed hosts from all across Europe, north, south, east, west, rural areas, urban re areas. Indeed, uh, European-wide support is the mantra of the program. And you can always apply, I promise. Katharina Astrid will confirm. Very easy uh, and simple application form, two pages only, briefly describing your challenges, your motivation. We can also support you in drafting the application. No need to get worried about that. And closing my short intervention, let me give you an example how this peer review support works in practice. So recently organized um, under the lead of Astrid, uh, one of our experts today, for the Polish region of Warmińsko mazurskie located in the beautiful northeast of the country on circular economy. And uh, we identified four relevant peers for this exercise, you see them from Italy, Slovenia, and Greece. And mainly we used those two days online, virtually in September to discuss how circular economy measures can be supported by the region's new operational program. Now we dive into regional policy and Warminsko Mazowskie is managing authority for the regional operational program. And very concrete questions were discussed during those two, de two days. Um, which type of beneficiaries to support? Under which policy objectives to support circular economy measures? And in the peer review report, which is available online, you also find very concrete examples for possible interventions, uh, in investments or soft measures like new business plans for companies. And as the quote from the region confirms, indeed, this exercise has contributed to the design of the new program. As you know, all the managing authorities, they're currently in the process of getting their new programs on track. And I think Astrid, Katarina, Marco, this example, as we are talking about funding today, today well builds a bridge today, to today's topic. Closing this presentation, let me wish all of you, let me wish all of us, well, fun and joy in getting new inspiration. Thank you very much. Back to you, Astrid. 
Thank you, Thorsten. Yes, we are always trying to be as concrete as possible and uh, as useful as possible uh, for our target communities. The topic today is the design and the use of the European Recovery Fund uh, uh, for the Green Transition. The so-called ERRF is designed as a vital lifeline to alleviate uh, the impact uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. At the same time, this fund is an important tool for transformative changes towards a sustainable and ultimately a net zero carbon economy by 2050. The stakes are incredibly high. We have never seen such an important fund being set up so quickly and it also has to be disbursed very rapidly by 2023. So there are a lot of questions about it uh, at all levels uh, and mainly, of course, in the European cities and regions, which are the territories that had to take the main blow of the pandemics and which are certainly very eager to get access to the fund. But the fund is managed uh, at the member state level. So we see we have here all administrative levels, European member states, regions, local level. So this is a governance uh, uh, challenge. The ERRF also has a very strong green dimension and therefore we have decided uh, to organize this webinar today for the Europe, Interreg Europe community that is working on green topics. That is uh, a low carbon economy, environment, resource efficiency, of course circular economy. And the aim today is uh, to learn as much as possible about the ERRF's uh, green dimension and uh, to hear some concrete examples from regional and local stakeholders on their experience, how to try and access the funds and make it useful for their territories. So uh, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, please uh, turn on your cameras uh, so that uh, I can show you to our uh, audience. So our first uh, uh, speaker is uh, Adela Tezarova. She's a deputy head of unit at the European Commission's DG Energy and she's in charge of uh, the economic analysis and financial instruments. Uh, Adela, thanks uh, for making yourself available. So you have seen we have specifically opted to have somebody from DGNR because we want to tackle uh, the green dimension of the ERF and not just have a general uh, discussion about the fund. Um, after that, uh, uh, my colleague uh, Simon Hankin uh, from the Policy Learning Platform will make uh, a brief presentation of a survey that we have held among the community um, to prepare this webinar. And uh, then we will have two speakers from uh, uh, regions and cities. Of course, Italy and Fra and uh, Spain are the countries uh, that are going to get uh, the largest share of the ERF. And so uh, we have naturally uh, been inclined to have speakers from these territories. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Alessandro Drago, who's a project officer at the Lazio region in Italy. That's the region uh, including Rome. And he's working in the economic programming direction. Hi, Alessandro. And uh, last but not least, uh, we're having uh, Dr. Irene ruiz Pathan, who is joining us uh, from uh, the provincial government of uh, Zaragoza in Aragon in Spain. Hi, Irene. Hi. So before handing over to uh, Adela for her keynote, uh, I would like uh, to query a little bit our large audience. We have uh, over 400 people signed up, uh, 216 have joined uh, uh, so far, and uh, we would like to hear from you, Lotte. Please launch the poll. What is your background? Um, are you working for a regional or a local authority? Just tick the right box. Are you working for another body with a public mission? Are you coming from uh, academia or from NGOs? And, um, so, uh, you know, GDPR means we cannot share the participant list with the speakers anymore. So this poll allows the speakers also to see a little bit uh, where you're coming from. Let's see the results. Okay, so the majority is from bodies with a public mission. 25% uh, regional authorities, almost 20 local authorities, uh, some academia and NGO. Good spread. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, the second poll, what are you expecting from today's webinar? And here you can tick as many boxes uh, as you're interested in. 
general information about the ERF? Uh, is it about the programming, um, the green dimension, what counts as green, what are the green criteria? How to influence the programming? Or would you like to see what other regions are doing? Let's see the results. Okay, so there's still a, a, a big craving for general information, not so much about the programming, but the green dimension. You see, this is uh, something that we will then uh, explore a little bit uh, uh, with our speakers. Um, okay, thank you very much uh, for these indications. And uh, it is my pleasure then to introduce uh, uh, or to give the floor to Adela for her keynote. Adela, the floor is yours. And um, I would like to invite the audience to make use of uh, the chat function and to type your questions uh, to Adela that might be coming up uh, during her presentation. My colleague Simon is going to read them loud uh, to her afterwards. Maybe uh, if we have uh, many, he has to select a little bit, but uh, we will try to make uh, as many questions uh, available for discussion. Adela. So good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, good afternoon from unusually sunny Brussels, <laughs> and I can imagine that I'm uh, I'm uh, talking to uh, to people across all Europe. Um, so I hope you are doing well, and hope you are you and your families are healthy. Um, so yes, I have about nine I have nine slides, so it's not a long presentation, and I hope I will address the uh, the issues that you have uh, raised in the poll. So tell you a, a bit more about the the programming under the recovery residence facility and what it means green under the uh, under the recovery residence facility. As I'm coming from the Commission's Department on, on Energy, uh, I will focus on energy, uh, but what I'm going to say applies uh, more broadly uh, to other uh, green uh, types of spending. Um, so can we move slide please? Thank you. Um, so to start with, I would like to give you um, um, some economics of all this. Um, um, you know, the recovery residence facility is here to help member states recover from the crisis. Uh, the objective is to create uh, growth and jobs. Um, why we think energy is very relevant in this context? Um, uh, because we have a very, a very high uh, job creation potential. Uh, this chart I'm showing on the slide. It comes from the International Energy Agency. It's, it covers different types of, of energy reforms and investments, um, uh, but it's quite a broad approach, also looking on transport and uh, beyond the energy sector. And you can see that the all highest job creation potential comes uh, uh, from uh, investing into energy efficiency of buildings. Uh, there is also high job creation potential related to uh, renewable electricity and electricity networks or in general uh, green energy networks. Um, I wanted, I mean, this is of course uh, International Energy Agency, so it doesn't go beyond energy, but uh, we use this slide because it's very telling um, and it, yeah. It shows basically job creation per, uh, per million uh, per, per dollars invested. Uh, can we go next, please? Um, this chart comes from the Commission's own modeling and uh, it comes from the climate target plan of last September, um, where we have calculated what is the uh, what is the investment gap related to our new climate ambition. And um, I call it investment opportunities because in fact, um, our new climate target of reducing emissions by 2030 by 55%, um, which is much more ambitious than the original 2030 target we had until recently, um, means uh, huge investment opportunities. Um, and these are again situated in, in exactly the same sectors. A uh, huge investment potential in a residential and tertiary sector, which means basically buildings, building renovation, improving the energy efficiency of buildings, making buildings greener beyond energy efficiency. This has enormous investment potential. You can call it investment gap, but uh, it, at a situation where we need to recover from the crisis, this is investment potential. Other sectors which will be target of investment in the current decade are transport, uh, 
and uh, green electricity, generation of renewable electricity, integration of renewable electricity into the electricity grid, storage, uh, as well as industry. And uh, we have calculated that um, the, the necessary investments to meet our new climate ambition across all sectors equal to about 350 billion per year on top of what we have been investing in the previous decade. So every year of the current decade, 350 billion is needed uh, to get to our new climate target. And um, yeah, and again, this is an enormous potential for, for green investments. Uh, can we go next slide? Um, this is then reflected also in the Commission's position on recovery, where the Commission would like to uh, build back better. And we have put the Green Deal, and you know that the Green Deal has a, has a climate as well as environment dimension. We have put the Green Deal at the core of recovery. And this is well reflected in the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which will be the, the main instrument of the MFF. Uh, to, to finance, uh, to help member states uh, recover from the crisis and to provide additional temporary funding at EU level. Um, the Recovery and Resilience Facility um, will offer, is offering because it's already in place, uh, legislation has been agreed and is, has entered into effect in February, in fact. Um, so, a Recovery and Resilience Facility will offer grants and loans uh, to member states on the basis of so-called recovery and resilience plans. These plans need to be consistent with the programming of the cohesion policy, which is prepared in parallel. They have to be consistent with all other uh, framework uh, we have in, in place, such as the European semester, uh, which, is our, um, which is the structure we have been using in the EU for economic policy coordination until the crisis. And they are pending recommendations to member states how to improve structurally their economies. And these recommendations can now be financed from the recovery residence facility. And of course, these recommendations have an important green dimension. Um, we also have the national energy and climate plans, which define how member states want to reach um, the 2030 energy and climate targets. Um, so the recovery and resilience plans need to be consistent with all this. They don't come we are not starting from scratch, we are building on what we already have. And, and the link to cohesion policy is, is, is of course strong, uh, including the just transition programming, which will come next and will be a useful complement to the recovery resilience plans. Um, the size of the facility is very big in terms of EU budget. Um, it consists of grants and loans, so it's more or less half-half. Uh, all member states will be asking for grants, um, not all member states will be asking for loans. Um, you know that in the EU budget, uh, we have uh, the 30% climate mainstreaming target. So 30% of all spending under the EU budget needs to go to climate relevant areas. Uh, the recovery and resilience facility has a bit higher target, is 37%. So this will be the main driver for, for green spending into the recovery resilience plans, this target. And the recovery and resilience facility has the potential to become the biggest green fund in the EU. Um, this is also reflected in, in, in the so-called flagships. Um, the Commission has, um, has um, suggested member states that there are seven areas which we would like to see covered in every single recovery and resilience plans because these areas have a huge job creation potential and, uh, and they, are, they, are come, they represent common challenges for all member states. Um, and these, uh, these flagship areas uh, have an important green dimension. I will talk about it in my next slide. Um, to sum up, uh, we see the recovery and resilience facility as a very important uh, driver of the green transition. The funds are going to be there, or it's up to member states, of course, but the 37% uh, climate mainstreaming target applies and has to be met. And, and with this, uh, th this is a really uh, important driver for, for green spending and green reforms. Uh, maybe that's what something I, I didn't say explicitly. Um, the recovery and resilience facility will finance investments and reforms. So for example, if there is some important structural reform which hasn't been done, hasn't been introduced for many years because it's politically sensitive and has big political costs, 
or big um, real costs of distribution, for example, the Recovery and Resilience Facility can finance costs of these reforms. Can we go to the next slide, please? And so this is uh, to show you the, the flagships, the green flagships. As I said, these are the areas we would like to see covered in all plans. We have one flagship called Renovate, which is about building renovation. Then we have a flagship called Power Up, which is about renewable energy and green hydrogen. Uh, then we have a flagship Recharge and Refuel, which is about greening the fuels uh, for, for the transport policy. Then we also have a flagship on clean urban mobility, which is more about clean air and mobility solutions for cities. And then we have a flagship on skills. And these are all relevant for the energy, uh, let's say for the green dimension of the plants. Um, what I show on this slide is also what concrete priorities we see in the area of energy. And again, this goes back to the slides I showed you at the beginning. What is the job creation potential of, of different uh, energy priorities? Uh, what is the investment gap or the investment opportunities we see in relation to the 2030 targets? So we have identified four areas um, which fit very well with these flagships. And these areas um, we think have the biggest job creation and investment potential. And uh, uh, we are happy to, to see that member states are picking up on these priorities and they are including them in their draft plans. Um, so the priorities are Renovation Wave, um, uh, which is a commission initiative to renovate as many buildings in Europe as possible and make them energy efficient, make them green and make them also um, um, yeah, smart for the future. Uh, then we have renewable energy, uh, green hydrogen and energy system integration. Energy system integration, which sounds maybe a bit more technical, um, this is basically about uh, optimizing the use of energy across all the economy, uh, electrifying um, transport, industry, um, providing green energy for industrial production processes and so on. Okay, can we go next? Um, now I have two slides, but I would like to go a bit more in detail um, what kind of um, investments and what kind of reforms we would like, uh, we, we think could be included in the recovery and resilience plans under these priorities and reflecting the, the recovery flagships to be a bit more concrete. So when it comes to the building renovation, what are the investments uh, we think are, have the highest potential? Uh, so it's renovation of public buildings and social infrastructure, meaning renovation and insulation of schools, uh, hospitals and other buildings belonging to the public sector. Uh, and this can be done also in a more market based way through the energy service companies. Another area which has huge potential for investments is renovation of residential buildings either private homes or uh, big uh, blocks of houses um, where there is a huge potential for energy savings and with that goes huge potential for creating jobs. And the last area is energy efficiency in SMEs, which again, um, SMEs, it's largely, build, uh, it's largely buildings uh, used by the companies. When it comes to renewable energy, uh, the key areas we see for investments are renewable power generation, so onshore and offshore wind energy, solar energy, uh, uh, other forms uh, of, of um, uh, renewable energy. Um, you know, you can have a lot of uh, tidal and ocean and uh, there are a lot of, uh, lot of things uh, developing in this area. And then it is a promotion of renewable based heating and cooling and e-mobility based on renewables, so renewable electricity for the transport sector, for electrification of the transport sector. A new area which has popped up this year very strongly is green hydrogen. We see hydrogen as, uh, as the potential solution for decarbonizing industry and decarbonizing uh, some part of the transport sector, such as heavy traffic. Um, there is a huge potential for upscaling the electrolyzer capacity for green hydrogen um, you might be aware that hydro green hydrogen is, is far from uh, competitive and so there is a scope for public investments in this area. Um, there is also sco scope for boosting the use of green hydrogen in, uh, in industry and transport. 
um, and uh, investing in infrastructure for transmission and distribution of green hydrogen. The last group uh, is the uh, so-called energy system integration. Here we are talking about transmission and distribution infrastructure for green energy, green electricity, smart grids, uh, storage, uh, so uh, huge uh, batteries to, uh, to store electricity or, um, or systems to, to store electricity in other ways, um, the so-called power to X solutions, um, investments in district heating and cooling, uh, direct electrification of end-use sectors, again talking about electrification of transport on, or industry, um, and infrastructure for transport of CO2. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and here I, I have a slide on uh, priority areas for reforms. Um, as I said, both reforms and investments can be covered by the recovery plans. Um, so when it comes to actual reforms, these reforms can be at national level, they can be at uh, a region or local level. For example, uh, when we talk about renovation of buildings, a very important reform, which we think could very well be reflected in the recovery and resilience plans, is our one-shop stops for energy efficiency financing projects. And these are typically regional or even local projects, they can be national as well. Um, and, uh, and, and, and RRF can provide useful financing for setting up such new schemes. Um, what is important uh, for a, a building renovation, we would like to see, um, I have to speed up, yeah, okay, we would like to see uh, see a deeper renovation, not only, um, uh, you know, very, very shallow renovations. Um, when it comes to renewables, a lot of scope for simplification of permitting processes and so on. I think I will skip this slide and if you have any questions, um, I can come back to that because I'm, I see that uh, I'm taking a lot of time to speak. <laughs> so, last three slides uh, where I would like to speak about what is green a bit more in general terms. Um, you know that under the MFF, uh, we define what is green through the climate tracking. Um, the climate tracking will be more or less defined across the entire MFF in the same way. Uh, so the recovery and resilience facility has its own um, annex with the climate markers. The climate markers are exactly the same as for the common provision regulation for regional policy. So there is no discrepancy and we are using the 10 and 40 percent and 0 percent marker. Um, there are important synergies between climate and environment here. Some environmental types of investments or reforms, such as circular economy, um, they count as 100% climate relevant. So the climate markers will be drivers for these type of investments. Um, otherwise, uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency are very important examples of, um, of climate relevant investments, uh, which will make it into the plants. Uh, there is also synergy between digital and energy. Uh, the Recovery and Resilience Facility is the only MFF instrument which has a um, digital uh, mainstreaming target as well. Um, so, for example, smart grids for energy, uh, they, um, uh, they contribute in both to digital and to, to climate. Uh, so, there are useful synergies. Um, um, maybe next slide. Um, there is also another specificity of the Recovery and Resilience Facility which is application of the do not significant harm principle. Uh, we have seen in the last stages of the MFF negotiations that this principle, which originally comes from the taxonomy regulation, which is um, a regulation for labeling uh, activities for the purpose of financial sector investment. Uh, so this principle has appeared in many MFF uh, um, instruments um, in a rather soft way, but it is there. Um, it is the most present in the Recovery and Residence Facility. Uh, possibly the reason is that the Recovery and Residence Facility doesn't have any exclusion list. So compared to regional policy, you don't see the following will not be financed. Uh, the only thing we have in the Recovery and Residence Facility is a reference to the do no significant harm principle, uh, which, has, uh, which um, refers to six objectives of the taxonomy regulation and basically means that no harm can be made to climate or to environment, uh, being it protection of water resources, circular economy, uh, pollution and protection of biodiversity and ecosystems. Um, 
How this will be applied in practice um, uh, remains a bit to be seen. We are testing it now with member states. Um, this principle has to be checked for every single measure of the recovery plan. Uh, so in principle, no fossil fuels can be financed uh, from a recovery and resilience facility. There are some very narrow exceptions uh, to allow for natural gas in situations of coal to gas switch. So when mem member states are phasing out coal capacities and temporarily they are switching to gas as a transition situation afterwards to switch to renewables or to uh, green hydrogen. So there are some narrow cases when gas financing is allowed, but in principle, no fossil fuels. Every measure has to be checked against this principle. There cannot be any harm to the environment. And um, we have simplification rules. So when a measure is classified as 100% or 40% climate relevant or environment relevant, uh, these measures will uh, be subject to simplified assessment for, for the for the do not significant harm because they are contributing positively to climate or environment. And my last slide, please. Um, here I, um, I would like to wrap up um, just to say that the green criteria will also uh, be taken into account when assessing whether a recovery plan presented by member state can be financed from the EU or not. So this is the very final stage, which we assume will take place in, in May and June when the final plans will reach Brussels. Uh, we expect to receive final plans uh, during the month of April or at the end of April. And all plans will be subject to this assessment. Uh, they have to pass these 11 criteria. If they do not pass these 11 criteria, uh, uh, member states will not be eligible to receive financing. Of course, the purpose is um, the Commission is working closely with member states uh, currently to help them design the plans in a way that they pass these criteria. I mean, it's no, nobody's intention to slow down financing uh, because the whole purpose of recovery is to make sure that member states of this recovery instrument is to make sure that member states receive financing. Um, uh, but I would like to flag especially criteria number five to you, uh, which is about green transition and has three components. And um, all these three components have to be satisfactorily met for, uh, for the plan to receive uh, an A, meaning to be, to be marked as, as, uh, as, as pass. Uh, so here, the, the green transition has three components. One of them is the 37% climate mainstreaming, which has to be met at the level of each plan. Uh, the plan has to have a lasting impact uh, for, for the green measures. And the, the green transition has to be fully reflected in the plan, including biodiversity and including the energy and climate targets of 2030 and climate neutrality objective for 2050. So this gives you a bit of flavor that um, while um, fulfilling the 37% climate mainstreaming target, um, there needs to be some energy, there needs to be some biodiversity. Um, otherwise, the plan will not be considered as sufficient and will not be able to pass. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adela. Okay, that was a little longer than expected, uh, but uh, um, I think very relevant, uh, especially the last slide. Um, without uh, uh, taking time, Simon, let's have the questions from the audience, please. I've seen some interesting ones coming in there. Uh, yep, okay, so just keeping an eye on time as well, I guess we can focus on uh, two or three questions. Uh, the first we had come in was, uh, can, uh, can you only submit to make use of grants and loans if you are a national body or also as a regional city? And so perhaps to expand that question a little bit, uh, could you tell us a bit about the, uh, the programming of the ERF and how these funds filter down to the regional level? Yes, thank you for these questions. So the recovery resilience plans are for member states. It is up to member states how they organize themselves internally. Member states, of course, need to consult. Um, if you are familiar with the National Reform Program, uh, which is the, uh, the document we have been using for economic policy coordination over the last 10 years, uh, the Recovery and Resilience Plan is very similar to the National Reform Program. It is a centrally managed document, which is drafted by the central government, usually Ministry of Finance or Prime Minister's Office, uh, has to be approved by the, by the parliament, of course, and um, in many member states, uh, needs to be subject to public consultation. 
And of course, the more inclusive the process, the better, uh, because it is in the interest of member states um, to, to capture in these plans um, everything which is ready to be financed, um, because the lifetime of the recovery residence facility is very short. Money needs to be committed by the end of 2023, and money has to be spent by the end of 2026. Uh, so the central government might not be aware of all the projects which are mushrooming in the regions, in the cities and need financing. So it is in the interest of the central government to actually reach out to project promoters, uh, to regional and local authorities and to find out as much as possible about what could be financed right now. Because if you have a project that still needs to go through an environmental impact assessment and permitting procedures, you will not make it to 2023. I mean, there is a risk. So the idea is to really look for ready-made uh, projects and, uh, and central government is not aware of those. So it will be very difficult to draft these plans and capture all existing projects uh, without um, reaching out to the rest of the country. Um, so the programming um, is uh, final plans by the end of April. Uh, draft plans, there has been a process uh, between, the uh, between the member states and the Commission starting from last October, where we have been in touch um, based on, on draft ideas, uh, different levels of, you know, different kind of advanced level of, of, uh, of ideas, back and forth, discussing together, helping member states um, how to apply the do not significant harm principle, clarifying what is green, what is not green, um, asking questions, you know, why do you do this, why don't you do that? Um, sometimes member states wanted to finance gas, so we made sure that, um, you know, this is not excessive and it is really, um, uh, we have a very strict conditions for gas financing, so we were helping member states to, to narrow it down. Um, so yeah, that's it. And then once these plans are approved, there is a two months from submission for, for the Commission and the Council to approve these plans. Disbursement will happen at the beginning once the plan is approved. Member States will get 20%, I think, pre-financing. And afterwards, it is a performance-based financing, meaning twice a year, Member States will report on achievements of milestones and targets. For example, you know, we want to do a reform. First step is we will present a draft reform to stakeholders. Second step, we will present it to the Parliament. Third step, reform is approved by the Parliament and is put in place. For every step, Member States can receive part of the financing. And at the end, when the reform is put in place, they will receive the, the final tranche of the financing. So it's not invoices, it's not, plan, it's not plans that decide on, on financing, it is actually achievements of milestones and targets. And the last check for milestones and targets is August uh, 2026. So every money, all the money has to be committed by 2023 and all the milestones and targets have to be met by August 2026. So that the last payment comes to member state at the end of 2026. But of course, the more we can front load, the more relevant and useful for recovery it is. Okay, let's take some more. Adela, maybe a bit shorter in the reply. Simon, go ahead. Yep, sure. Uh, so we also had a question uh, related to co-funding. Uh, so this question was, uh, if a project is benefiting from the ERRF, can it also benefit from other EU funds? So the ERDF, Horizon Europe, uh, LIFE and, and yes, so on. Yes, yes. Not the same spending, but the project, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then perhaps the last question, Katarina, I'm not sure how much time we have. Um, yes, well. Okay, so I mean, the, the fund so far seems to be quite focused on cities and urban centres. Uh, so we had a question asking how are depopulated and rural areas included in this plan? But it's up to member states, I mean, for what kind of projects they include. Uh, and there is a lot of potential for, uh, I don't know, renewable generation or, you know, there, is, um, there are no limits on that. Uh, there is certainly no preference for cities or it's up to member states. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Adela, Astrid, uh, let's move on. Uh, yes, hello, so um, we have uh, organized this webinar uh, for the Interreg Europe community, um, and this community is mainly bringing together regional and local level authorities and stakeholders, and not really the national level authorities. 
So to this end, we have carried out a, a little survey with them to prepare this webinar and to understand better what are their needs and their expectations. So my colleague Simon is now going to present to you what are the results of that little survey. Thank you. Okay, back to me again. Uh, thank you, Astrid. Uh, so yeah, as Astrid said, you know, with so many opportunities under the recovery and resilience uh, facility, uh, we were curious to find out about how active and engaged our community was in the preparation uh, and future implementation of national recovery and uh, resilience plans. So uh, while member states are being advised, of course, as we've heard, to involve regions in drafting their plans, we know that this is not something that's being universally applied in the same manner. It's not an obligation, but a recommendation. And there seem to be quite a lot of um, different national uh, approaches. Uh, so we wanted to see what the situation really was within our low carbon economy and environment communities. Uh, so we created a questionnaire to find out what regions are doing to influence plans, uh, to see which priorities are uh, they are they're most interested in, and also to learn more about the kind of projects that the regions are actually wanting to implement. Uh, so in this session, I will briefly present the results of this survey to provide some context. And then afterwards, uh, we'll go into two in-depth presentations looking at two regional uh, approaches. Uh, so in total, we received 87 responses from the community and beyond uh, from 19 different uh, countries. So that's 17 EU member states plus the United Kingdom and Singapore. Uh, since they cannot access the Recovery and Resilience Fund, I've removed the UK and Singapore from, uh, from the analysis. Uh, so we have uh, the 17 member states represented. Uh, it's worth noting that not all of the respondents uh, were specifically regional or local authorities. Many of them were, uh, but some were rather uh, regional knowledge or expertise providers that would have a role in um, supporting policymakers and public authorities. Uh, so the graph on the right shows the distribution of the responses that we received uh, with Italy, Spain, Greece, and uh, Romania being particularly active in our survey. Uh, so the first question that we asked was related to which of the sort of green uh, flagship areas areas were of most interest. And as you can see, almost 70% uh, viewed clean technology and renewables as being of high importance, almost 60% on uh, sustainable transport, just over 50% on energy efficient building renovation, and about 45% in education and training for digital skills. Um, as well as the multiple choice question that was available, we allowed individuals to also to comment and give further information. Uh, so here's a bit more detail on each of those uh, flagships. Uh, so under clean energy, there was particular interest in new instruments to stimulate private investment, uh, public support for hydrogen in industry and transport uh, and renewable heating uh, and also support in developing uh, energy communities. Um, under sustainable transport, comments related to new mobility services, uh, pedestrianization and cycling infrastructure, as well as improving public transport. Uh, for buildings, many recognize the need to switch their focus to private and not only public buildings, uh, tackling energy poverty, making use of nature-based uh, solution and also solutions and also improving uh, heritage and listed buildings. Uh, and for education and skills, there was particular interest in sustainable entrepreneurship, digital participatory uh, processes, and the overlap between digital skills and circular economy. Uh, when looking at the types of projects, you'll see here particular interest in wanting support to develop new strategies and plans, to provide training uh, to increase local capacity and skills, uh, and also to create new uh, infrastructure. So again, to focus uh, topic by topic, there was particular interest in plans and strategies for the blue economy, zero waste and circular economy. Understandably, these very often came together. Uh, then also strategies and plans to involve the private sector in the transition. Uh, interest in infrastructure development was mentioned in relation uh, to organic waste collection and management, um, e-mobility, particularly, of course, charging stations, uh, multimodal transport hubs, and then also infrastructure for research and development. Um, trainings focused on many of the topics that I've just 
mentioned under those two or other themes, uh, but they mentioned in particular trainings on circular uh, business models uh, and also trainings for public officials and green public procurement. Uh, the final question focused then on regional attempts to influence the recovery and resilience plans uh, with around 45% of our respondents uh, saying that they have participated in a stakeholder meeting or they're busy identifying projects at the regional level uh, to look for future funding. And then around 20% have drafted a position paper, but you'll see quite a large number are trying other approaches or have not tried any approach um, at all. So in the responses, yep, we can see large differentiation here from those who have held meetings with the regional government, uh, drafted proposals for them to take to national ministries, uh, to those who are identifying the local projects to be funded. Uh, in some cases, working on project aggregation, in others, bringing stakeholders together to form sort of proto consortia. Uh, but then we also have many who simply don't know where to start. So hopefully this, um, session today can give some inspiration to those uh, regions of what to do next. And with that, I'll wrap up and pass back to Astrid. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you very much for bringing to us what the, the regions and the local level uh, is expecting and needing. I think it's uh, quite interesting and also quite in line with what Adela has been presenting. So hopefully this all will fit together very nicely in the future. And uh, we will want to hear now our first uh, regional experience from uh, Alessandro Drago, which I'm asking to uh, make your presentation uh, of what you are planning in Lazio. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'll try to be as fast as possible. So, uh, so I'm uh, Alessandro Drago from Lazio region. I'm a project officer working for the Economic Program Direction. And I will introduce you to our participation to the European Recovery and Resilience Facility in Italy. Uh, some uh, things on our uh, regional context. Uh, we are uh, an early 6 million people uh, region in the center of Italy. And uh, our economy is characterized. Alessandro, put the full screen mode, please, otherwise we don't see very sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks. So I, I was saying that we are an early six million people region in the centre uh, in the centre of Italy, with an economy characterised by the strong presence of SMEs and uh, great state companies and multinational. Uh, we have about four hundred forty-seven thousand active companies, including industry, commerce, and crafts, uh, with about two million employees in this sector. Um, of course, the COVID impacted our region as uh, or the other regions in Europe and all over the world, I should say, uh, on how health and economy. Uh, the reaction we had uh, was in the uh, health sector. Uh, we reorganized, we made a reorganization plan over the hospital network in COVID-19 emergency following a, a, a national legislative decree and in line with the economic measures launched by the EU, so the SHU program and by the Italian government and the Creatory Story. Also the Lazio region has been economically supporting the SMEs uh, since the first lockdown with uh, specific measures like the non repayable loans, uh, measures to match the liquidity needs of micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, which was the main problem immediately after the, the COVID started. And of course, we uh, we, we gave these, uh, we provided these uh, measures also for the freelancers holding about uh, numbers of the professionals. And it was very important that we could use uh, even the ERDF funds 2014-2020 uh, converted in this kind of measure, measures, which was very, uh, you know, unusual in terms of uh, uh, programming cycle, but very useful for us in that moment. Um, just to make uh, to have an overview of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, of our uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, I've just drawn uh, as what analysis made uh, on two important domains, two important analysis for our region, which is uh, the research and innovation and competitiveness and international internationalization, uh, directly drawn from the uh, uh, regional smart um, uh, strategy of Lazio uh, and as you can see there are some strengths uh, very relevant 
for us, which are represented by the high level of public spending of research and development, the presence of industrial and multinational groups, high presence of research infrastructures. We have a good geopolitical position uh, and an international attraction for the metropolitan area of Rome, especially. But we also have important weaknesses, like the fact that the SMEs have a low propensity to spend on research and development, a reduction, uh, let's say, poor competitiveness of the regional system as a whole, um, a small company size in key sectors for us, which are agri food and tourism, and difficulty in accessing credit, especially for SMEs, and especially banking credit. Um, the opportunities we do have in our region is the exponential growth of business incubators and accelerator. This is a very important factor and a very important and relevant phenomenon for us in the last years. The presence of multinationals stimulating the SMEs. Um, of course, the exports in technological niche of excellence and the geopolitical position, as in the case of our strengths. The main threats we have faced, and we are facing in the moment, uh, is the reduction of, pub, uh, of public resources, uh, the brain drain, and uh, poor competitive, uh, let's say, the, the, the poor protection of luxury and agri food products, which are, as I said before, uh, represented mainly by, mainly by small company size in these uh, sectors. Uh, well, um, as uh, stated by the country report to Italy published in 2000, February 2020, uh, all the, uh, the European region, regions were expected to uh, um, approve a regional strategy for the sustainable development. And we started uh, uh, in, uh, in May to make uh, uh, and to organize a stakeholders meeting in order to, um, let's say, collect ideas and projects uh, to draft this regional strategy. And so far we have, uh, after many meetings, we have organized, of course, uh, pending by the COVID, which uh, impacted negatively on this process. We have um, set uh, and uh, um, we have uh, focused this strategy on uh, the seven following thematic priorities, which are the adaptation to climate change and water resources, sustainable mobility, blue economy, poverty, access to study, um, circular economy, smart cities. Uh, as I said, these are uh, the seven keys, let's say, seven important keys uh, to uh, uh, reach uh, final and approve a final strategy on uh, uh, for the sustainable development which will be very useful for the implementation of the uh, national uh, uh, recovery resilience facility um, how we did access to these? Well, we are in the process, we are in, on the move in a way. Um, of course, as you know, uh, the communication from the Commission 575 of 2020 on annual sustainable growth strategy 2021, the EC provided to the member states the recommendations to draft the national uh, recovery and resilience plans and projects to submit for funding. On the other side, the national state gave the regions uh, the chance uh, to participate uh, to uh, this national, to the drafting of the national plan, as regions in Italy are very important, uh, as you may know probably, uh, we have many functions delegated by the state, especially in uh, um, very important sectors as health, uh, environmental protection, cultural, uh, cultural heritage, tourism, uh, urban planning. Uh, regions in Italy are uh, legislative bodies. This means that we can make laws on several fails and so we have um, uh, with with uh, relevant importance in the, the process the decision, decision making process uh, so a cabinet of directions uh, was created by the states where the region can and the, of course the autonomous province uh, obviously can uh, um, interact and uh, the president of this cabinet of direction as the members of the regions uh, to indicate their project priorities to include in the national um, recovery and resilience plan, considering, of course, three strategic lines, which are the modernization of the country, ecological transition, social and territorial inclusion, gender equality, and the nine lines of intervention identified by the same uh, plan, which I'm not mentioning now because the time is very straight. But what is important is that we add this chance for the, 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 the state government, government to uh, participate somehow uh, to the um, creation of this plan. And uh, the economic programming direction of Lazio region, which is actually the, the, the direction I've been working at for, for, for a long period, um, sent to the cabinet of directions, uh, I mentioned before, the list of interventions proposed 
as current, of course, with the EC recommendation and the Italian National Recovery Resilience Plans, and complementary, of course, to the future programming tools. This is a very important uh, um, point uh, because, as you know, uh, as regions, we are uh, managing authorities of the uh, EI EIS funds, and so we have, uh, let's say, to collect ideas and projects and then to channel them through the uh, um, uh, economic uh, tools, economic instruments uh, uh, coming from different source of funding, Europe, national. And so the, the, big, um, uh, the big issue is to uh, provide a perspective of unitary policy uh, from the regional presidency, uh, collecting ideas, collecting uh, projects, but then to channeling them in the uh, uh, right instruments economic instruments uh, uh, for the territory. Uh, so basically what we have done is to design uh, strategic lines, missions and of course uh, interventions. Now I will mention uh, for uh, time uh, reasons linked to the, the, the time available only the strategic lines and the missions we have submitted. These are proposals sent by the Lazio region to the national government as a contribution for the definition of project priorities to be considered for the drafting of the national recovery and resilience plans. The strategic lines are three, as I mentioned before, are the modernization of the country, which is a conditio sine qua non to improve uh, and to uh, enhance and to uh, maximize the impact of this funding, uh, which we have proposed to allocate the 41.2% of the entire amount um, proposed by Lazio region to the national government. The ecological transition, which represent 30.8%, this amount and the social inclusion and territorial gender equality, which amounts for the 27.9%. Of course, all these three strategic lines are organizing different missions, and these missions, uh, the same way, are organized in the same year in individual interventions. Uh, the modernization of the country is basically um, uh, targeted to the dig digitization, innovation, and competitiveness of the production system and the mobility infrastructure. The ecological transition is directed to the green revolution and ecological transition, including um, sustainable mobility too. And the social inclusion and territorial gender equality uh, concerns basically uh, these uh, three uh, missions, uh, very important for us, which are the social, gender and territorial e equity, the education, training, research, culture and health. All, all, three, all these three are very important for the renovation of the country and for the, uh, let's say, modernization and change which uh, has been requested in the country report to Italy uh, for the, uh, let's say, national uh, reforms. Uh, last but not least, uh, which I think is worth to be mentioned, is our participation in Interreg Euro projects. Uh, actually, as region, we are directly involved in 10 uh, European projects funded by the Interreg Europe. And this provides, uh, let's say, very important input and have been providing very important input to, to uh, define uh, the, uh, the strategies, the regional strategy for sustainable development. Let's say this work has uh, food for mind. And uh, this is all. This, uh, this is my presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Alessandro. This is uh, very impressive what you have been presenting, uh, the process that uh, you have been going through to define your priorities. So thank you very much for sharing this with us. And uh, we will uh, spare all the questions to answer them together after the presentation also of uh, Irene. So please, uh, Irene Ruiz Passan from Saragossa, if you could also make your presentation uh, about your experiences. Mike, Mike, please, Mike, please. Excuse me. Thank you very much for let us being here uh, presenting the work we are doing between the project MOMAR. Okay, MOMAR is an interact project with means providing a strategic thinking in the use of cultural and natural resources. Okay, and it's very important in our territory because, as you can see in this slide, we are in a very, very inequality territory in which we have zones with a very low density of population, rural areas that had, on the other hand, a very important and rich heritage, in many cases UNESCO heritage. And so in this rural context, we are working in order to improve new policies that have a special regard 
to the possibilities that we have with, within heritage to develop these territories. An overview on the territory makes us see one of his greatest strengths, okay, which is the position, the logistical position, okay, it's Zaragoza is in the middle of the north cities of Spain, like uh, Barcelona, Madrid, Bilbao and Valencia, and has an enormous potential for communications and logistics. It's also very important, the uh, agricultural contest between the, uh, the national contest, and also we have an strong power in um, renewable energies, okay, so we have very important key points, as of course, heritage for a project that should be developed in this new uh, assignment of the funds. Okay, here you can see um, a fast overview, okay, about all the uh, SWOT analysis we can do about our region. And also, this is what analysis has been used in order to try to uh, develop the strategy for applying to the funds. Okay, we have looked so much about our territory, or we have tried to find a strategy that could uh, develop and empower all the strengths that already exist in the territory. Of course, we think that thinking about heritage could be also a possibility to develop these, uh, these possibilities that we haven't talked about this uh, today, but we think we can have a strategic thinking about this and we we'll try to develop it. From our project from MoMAR, we have been analyzing the impact of COVID on the region. And of course, with our stakeholders that came mostly from the heritage and cultural world, we were trying to seek new ideas and opportunities to face the enormous damage that the sector has suffered during this year. And we have also analyzed with them that most of the aid has been received from the local or regional level. And we are trying to encourage them to apply for national uh, programs for recovering from this uh, success and from this uh, disease and also to try to add new strategies that are more in a line of being more collaborative and working all together. As you can see, uh, the Aragonese region has, has structured the access to the air between uh, the collaboration of different agents implied in their uh, implementation. So for designing this strategy, they have been called not only representatives of the regional government, but also social agents and the Aragonese Federation of Municipalities, Regions and Provinces. There was an agreement on the purpose of working all together in order to develop the project that will be a part of the National Recovery Plan. And this strategy was approved in June. It is focused in four main categories, recovery of the territory, recovery for the public policies, recovery for the product economy, and also recoveries in terms of unemployment that, as you know, is a very um, strong problem in Spain. Here you have the scheme that solves the current status displayed by the government of Spain in order to work with the government of Aragon and organize the access to the IRF. So this has been a very collaborative uh, design of the plan of the strategy that we think and we hope that could, that could work for reaching the objectives of these funds. Here you see also the four proposals, these four categories of recuperation and the three objectives of a more greener, more social and more digital Aragon and all the projects that match uh, these strategies with these categories, okay? And it's very important and uh, we are working in deep in within of your pro or project in the energy efficiency of public buildings, but also in the energy efficiencies of heritage buildings. Okay, preserving their existing heritage is a fundamental principle, not only from a cultural point of view, but also because it's one of the most we can say that uh, sustainability ways of using the already existing buildings. But this is a great challenge we are facing because. It's difficult, very difficult to preserve the historical and artistic values and make them compatible with a contemporary, a sustainable use of the buildings. This is one of the cases we are studying in deep within our BOMAR project, of internal project, and it's something we are trying to apply also in a coordinated way from different countries in order to develop a strategy for this purpose. So those are the main points of the three uh, changes we want to see in Aragon. We want to see a greener Aragon, and here you have all the uh, main topics we are working on, climate action, clear and affordable energy, industrial strategy for circular and clean economy, smart and safe mobility, farm to table strategy, which is very important, as I was saying 
before, we have also a very important sector of uh, agricultural and ganadery uh, production, preserve and protect biodiversity. We were saying we have a very, very important natural uh, heritage and we want to invest on that and ferropollutants and clean environment of toxins. We are also working in making a more digital Aragon and of course a more social Aragon in the line of the rest of Europe is working. And in our, pro in our project, we are trying to facilitate this access to the IRF. We were seeing in the, in the survey that has been presented today that we think there is an enormous uh, this understanding and a lot of uh, knowledge about what to do and what kind of projects can be financed by these funds that should be very quick, as we were saying. So we're trying to organize not only meetings among our stakeholders, but also to put them in contact, here you can see some images, to the experts of our government in order to make a more clear dialogue between the stakeholders and people who can give them to apply for the funds. So Aragon at this moment has is considering more than 150 public and private projects from our sectors and we have a budget that excess that the 10 billion euros. And since October, the government of Aragon has been submitting these project proposals to the government of Spain. We are working in that way. And so we are developing all together the España Puede National Recovery Resilience Plans. And we are also uh, taking into account that maybe some of these projects would be finalized between these funds, but we are also merging strategies for using these funds. And we are also, and I think this is very important for the government of Aragon, acting a politics and a policy of simplifying the administrative process that in our country is quite complicated, as I suppose in the rest of Europe. And so this is also part of the strategy to make more accessible also from the administrative point of view, the access to the funds. So this should be everything. I have tried to be as fast as possible due to the lie of to the seminar. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Irene. That was very useful as well. And uh, we have seen that you have also undergone a similar process, uh, as we have heard already from the colleagues in Italy before, to, to, to put forward your needs and uh, uh, what you think would be best uh, for the facility to, to support. So maybe uh, with that, we uh, can see if we have uh, some questions uh, to you as well. Maybe, Simon, we can... <coughs> Let, let's open the floor to uh, uh, all the panel. Please, uh, uh, all the speakers, uh, switch uh, switch on your camera so that we can discuss together. I'll kick off uh, with a question uh, that is uh, for everybody relatable. That is uh, coming from uh, Alison. Alison is asking. So how about uh, projects that are not uh, mature? If uh, there are no mature projects that cannot be, let's say, allocated by 23 and spent by 26, what does a region do? Is it not more important to wait to have the right projects uh, than to fund the wrong ones? So uh, I think this is one for all the levels. Uh, uh, Adela, Alessandro and uh, Irene, maybe you take them from EU to regional to provincial government. Yes, maybe I can say what we are doing about this uh, not very developed projects, okay? We launched a call for ideas, okay? For all the ideas that our stakeholders had, as we said in the, in their, I don't know how to say, but all the ideas they have, they were, were never uh, developed, they didn't have funds and so on. So we make a list of ideas, okay? We put all together. And we try to put them together, the, the stakeholders that have same ideas or same topics, okay? And we create round tables in order to make them develop it as quickly as possible in order to apply to this fund. So we try to make a joint strategy among our stakeholders to ask them for a list of ideas and try to work together in order to work faster, okay? This is one of the strategies we are trying to develop. So put all the, the already existing ideas, even if they were not so developed, and make people work together, stakeholders work together in order to arrive as soon as possible, as I was saying, to an idea that we can also sustain and obviously help them to, to develop it. 
And for that, we were also trying to make these uh, meetings with the responsibilities of the funds in order to give them also answers to the questions and try to be as, more, as operative as we can. Okay, so this is what we are doing. Okay, um, well, in Italy, uh, for instance, uh, in September 2020, the national government made uh, some guidelines, published guidelines to draft the national uh, plan for uh, recovery and resilience. And uh, in these guidelines, it was quite clear, uh, written that uh, pr projects with some problems, especially procedural pro problems, uh, uh, should be avoided somehow following the guidelines of the European Commission, uh, because of course we have very strict time to fund uh, a project that have to be implemented in the in, in the time plane set by the European Commission. Uh, at the same time, another important recommendation uh, we have taken into account is that we, all the projects we want to propose have to be in line with the uh, European sector sectoral policies. Uh, an example could be the sustainable mobility. We know from the white paper published in 2011 that we have to uh, work on projects uh, to transfer uh, the um, uh, transport of uh, goods from a road to rail. So we, we, we must to keep in mind that these kind of projects have to be the priority on other projects. Uh, so we have some guidelines uh, guiding us uh, because there are guidelines uh, on the right projects to present and of course uh, uh, on the procedural timing that we have to respect. So from my side, I would say that what is not ready for the RRF uh, will be ready for cohesion policy, which has a longer time frame. So they are complementary. And uh, so I would just leave it. I would continue the work to make sure that these projects are ready, but I would put them in the cohesion programming. Great. Okay, Simon. Yep. Okay. Oh. We also, had, we also had a question which was asking for the link between uh, uh, Interreg Europe and uh, the ERF. Uh, I think we have already seen that uh, some examples also from Irene and, uh, and Alessandro that uh, you're using it uh, also to prepare what, you, what are your needs and, and to give input and ideas. Is there anything else you think could be, uh, could be said about this link from your side? Uh, well, fr from my side, I think it's very interesting, very important to link uh, the interreg Europe results uh, into the, uh, of course, uh, uh, national um, uh, recovery resilience plan. Uh, it's not always very easy because uh, uh, the result of the exchange of good practices, uh, um, you know, uh, sometimes uh, uh, have a hard time to be inserted in the economic programming. Uh, this is because uh, uh, normally these kind of projects uh, are uh, are not uh, not very important. They are very important, but uh, they are not as big as uh, uh, could be other projects. So they have some difficulty to make this a step. Uh, uh, but uh, from my side, I've been following uh, now five uh, projects uh, funded by the second, third, and fourth call of the Interreg Europe. Uh, I found out that there are very, very interesting good practices to be transferred in different sectors, especially from the environmental sector. I can mention some uh, projects I'm following, like Condref and uh, Waste uh, uh, Recycle. Uh, or uh, star cities from like for the riverside tourism or others that are very interesting and that they have very good practices that could be transferred in our country in our regions but still we have some problems in uh, uh, um, going forward uh, in any case uh, it's something that we have to try to yes we i think our mm -hmm. position is a little bit different because it's, cl it's clear that interact project is maybe it's not so powerful like other projects but in our case, is uh, one of the leading uh, activities that is happening in heritage in our in our region. So we are using interact project, let's say that, like a tool, okay? Especially because our interact chains of experience are always open to a lot of stakeholders since they are online. In order to make like a catalysator, I know a revulsive, in order to spread also these possibilities that are beyond the interact possibilities among our stakeholders because are the same that has to apply for these projects and that has to talk with the authorities in order to design this plan. So we are trying to see this uh, pandemic um, situation like an opportunity to get uh, more, more, more involvement 
in the stakeholders, among the stakeholders, and to disseminate the ideas and to disseminate also the possibilities because one of the main problems that we have on our region is that people don't know really the possibilities that they will have within this fund. So we are trying to use, let's say that, our project in order to create synergies that goes beyond than only the, the possibilities that we have within the internet. And also, as I was saying, for us to be able to open the interchange of experience to many stakeholders that otherwise wouldn't be able to travel to all these uh, meetings, for us it's a great opportunity because ideas are coming up, okay? So we are feeling this kind of, uh, I don't know how to say, but as far as in situation that we are trying to, to take the opportunity to, to do something to change the territory. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, I think we can jump from synergies with Interreg and come back to what we discussed earlier on regarding synergies with other funds. Uh, so I asked a question earlier on about mixing ERF funding with the ERDF and other sorts of uh, funding. Uh, we had a follow-up question to that, asking actually for good practices or examples of synergies of the two funds. Uh, so perhaps I could ask Adela if she can think of any there are synergies between the funds, but of course, if Alessandro and Irina have examples from their regions and also please uh, jump in at Adela, please. Yeah, I don't have examples at this stage because this is all being worked out. Um, they are in principle complementary and complementary is encouraged um, as long as you don't finance exactly the same costs. But of course, these funds work on a different basis which might make the complementary a bit more complex than it sounds on paper. So this is going to now is being worked out on in the case of the concrete plans actually as we are talking to member states so i don't have any example to to show uh, but in principle it's possible of course um yeah uh, you meant the impact uh, of uh, interact euro project results uh, to the erdf funds yeah I, in the sense yes I've, I've got a couple of, of significant meaningful examples uh, especially in two projects I followed uh, urban manufacturing, we were able to impact uh, the RDF funds uh, uh, with the co creation uh, approach using a steam house in Birmingham uh, in our um, accelerators and uh, uh, regional network of uh, Fab Lab. It was very, very interesting. Uh, we achieved this result. Another one was in the, another project named Ellersolves, uh, where we could exchange good practices and uh, um, energy uh, saving in a in, in building. Uh, through uh, exchange of good practices among uh, some partners from uh, Sweden and uh, uh, Spain uh, into our ERDF funds, uh, funding the uh, sustainable, uh, sustainability in, the, in our regional buildings. So we have good examples in this. Yeah. Alessandro, I'm not sure. I, I think the question was about the synergy between the ERDF and the European Recovery Facility Funds. Oh, and right. There is also okay. another question directly for you. Somebody is asking which projects are you keeping for the ERRF and which ones for the ERDF? Uh, which project I'm keeping for the ERDF uh, now in the next uh, programming cycle, cycle programming, you mean? Well, since oh, well. you have to be quick in proposing projects, green projects for the recovery yeah. facility, uh, yes. which okay. are, you, are you selecting the best ones which you had previously in mind maybe to fund from ERDF and you submit them under all right. Yes. Okay. Sure. Yes. Well, uh, we have a list of, uh, let's say, uh, cluster in, in, in interventions that we have selected, especially in our region. Uh, we are uh, cut out of uh, sustainable mobility, uh, energy efficiency in buildings, uh, which we have partly funded through the ERDF funds in 2014-2020 that we would like to implement through the uh, um, uh, national plan on uh, recovery resilience yes there are some of them of course we want to maximize the results achieved with the programming cycle ERDF's programming cycle uh, through the, the national plan of course there are many yes uh, mobility energy efficiency and uh, other sector yes modernization digitization yeah there's not one in particular I mean we have many
I mean, I think uh, the question about uh, how to combine the ERDF uh, yeah. and the recovery facility, I think it's a very, very important question because if I listen to Adela's uh, presentation about uh, the flagship and what initiatives uh, uh, could be funded, we have been working on all of these topics in the Interreg Europe program to prepare the cities yeah. and the regions to submit good projects for uh, the ERDF. Yeah, talk about uh, a renovation of buildings, uh, the establishment of one shop shop, stop shops, the um, development of financial instruments to speed up uh, uh, the energy renovation of buildings, uh, mobility topics, skills, reskilling um, in view of the green transition. We have covered all these topics. So where is it possible to find out more about how to combine these funds? Uh, I think uh, this is a question that many regional stakeholders uh, will want to uh, reply so that they can also sequence uh, the programming and select which one how. Yeah, I mean, the rules are in, uh, in the ERDF regulation on, in general terms. Um, but in practice, I think the approach is what is urgent, what is ready, uh, can go in, in the RRF and there is, there is no co-financing. So you can have the entire project financed, but then you can have projects of similar kind, which are not ready at this stage. And therefore you can finance them under ERDF. Um, you know, we have at EU level, for example, we have this CEF, Connecting Europe Facility which is mm -hmm. a big project which the Commission approves. So we know how much we have already spent, we know how much is missing. And uh, for example, if these projects are um, very well advanced, we advise member states to put them under RRF, because then there will be other projects which can be financed from CEF. They are not yet ready. And we know that the CEF financing is until 2027. So we will be happy to handle those projects in two, three years time when they are ready. And I think similar approach could be done for cohesion policy. I mean, what is really ready now, within this month, she can still make it into the programs, uh, into the recovery resilience plans, and the rest, similar projects, um, can be financed under ERDF. Or you have an ERDF project which is ongoing, for some reason, um, uh, something didn't go well, and uh, additional financing is needed, so that could go into the RRF as well. You know, or it is the expansion of an existing project which has already been financed, and we, we are, uh, so it's more in this way. Uh, I, I would say it's a complementarity in time and in additions uh, in terms of investment needs. Um, yeah. Okay, Simon. Any 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 interesting questions from the audience uh, that you would like to share? Um, I think that the remaining questions are quite targeted to individual speakers, um, so I think that we can pass up on them. Um, but I think we had some pre-prepared questions that we can perhaps end with. Um, so I would ask perhaps each speaker, they can tell us, um, what would you recommend to regional and local uh, stakeholders who are finding it so hard to get involved uh, in the public consultation process uh, for our participants who have not yet begun to try to influence the plans? What's the first step that they should be uh, taking? after this webinar. And I'll let somebody volunteer to, to go first. Okay, Irana. maybe I can start, okay. I think after this seminar, if you haven't already done anything in order to start thinking, because I think, and it's very important in the, between the internet contest, you should have ideas. If you have participated in an internet project, you should have ideas that you weren't able to develop or are in the middle, in a middle position or something like that, try to put that down, okay? And try to find help with your local authorities, with the people you have been working between the interact project or not with the government. And for us, and as I was explaining all the time, try to put together different stakeholders with the same objective or more or less, and try to delineate an next strategy and then ask. Because one thing we see so many, uh, frequently is that people is not asking what they can to do okay we have so many documents as alessandro was saying our strategy is public it's on the website of the government of aragon you can read it it's very easy to understand so try to move yourself try to find another stakeholders that are in your same position and ask for help to your local authorities because we are willing to help you and to develop projects okay but the ideas 
I think are already in the territories, okay? Maybe not very well developed, maybe not uh, implemented, but they are, okay? Because we have been working on this for several years and so try to put them on move and uh, do it yourself. I don't know how to say it, but try to ask and uh, because I think it's the, um, it's the first point, but it seems so obvious and so uh, simple, but some people is not asking and it's not asking to the right people for help, okay? And I think we are all willing to help and to work together and to accompany these uh, stakeholders in order to design their project. So I think one thing is to come from the bottom, okay? A bottom-up solution could be a good uh, strategy for, for start moving and applying, okay? And reading because all the information, all the strategies are already on the internet and are at disposal of the public, okay? But Sometimes people has not read them, so I think it's some obvious, but uh, it's the reality we, we found. Okay, so this is my advice. Okay, thank you, uh, Alessandro. Uh, well, in our case, I have to say that uh, uh, due to the COVID, uh, the participatory process we started with the stakeholders uh, really slowed down since March uh, and on. This is a I have to, to say that. Uh, other, the, other, the other problem is that uh, it's not very easy to explain uh, to uh, all the stakeholders how the um, um, financial mechanism work because they are not so easy. I mean, the, the regulation are not easy, the programs themselves uh, sometimes are hard to be explained, uh, but we should improve our efforts to increase uh, the number of uh, tools to share uh, knowledge and to spread information, uh, probably social tools uh, and any kind of tool. Um, of course, it's important even to have a face to face approach, and uh, probably this the Commission could help us uh, in a way to identify the right tools or the, the right methods to improve knowledge and to get closer to, to people. Because of course the stakeholders matter is is, is, a, is a is a big question. If I can add something that we already did is that we organized our last stakeholder meeting of the interact project in a public way. Okay, a local newspaper was transmitting it uh, live. So we invited the experts of the region on European funds to explain the key points. And we make it as open as we can, okay? So using this local newspaper, and we have a great response of stakeholders. Not only the stakeholders we have already identified, we can see we identify new stakeholders or so new people or associations, foundation interested in the project, okay? Also not only from Zaragoza, which is regional, I mean, it's one from all Aragon and also Spain. So try to spray the balls. I don't know how to say that, okay? But use the tools that uh, the new technologies are allowing to us to. So we we use mm -hmm. the newspaper and the an open channel. It was online by email. The questions mm -hmm. were asking by, were arriving by email. Some like this uh, seminar. Um, I think it was quite positive and also invite people because as I was saying, the responsible about the funds were willing to speak with the stakeholders, okay? And so maybe you can use your interact project as a point for meeting all these people and try start to discuss strategies in our case about heritage, okay? But uh, I think it could be used in, in every sector. Okay, thank uh, you. Maybe just from, from, from me, um, I would say March is the last opportunity to influence the content of the recovery resilience plans. So if you have any good projects, uh, investment projects or even reform ideas, um, just put them in an email and try to get this information uh, to your um, local government or even central government um, via the usual channels, of course, that you have uh, available. But I would do that. I would put any good ideas uh, in an email and I would send it um, to, um, to the people who can uh, incorporate it in the plan. Really, March is the, the, the moment and the member states are still struggling to make the plans more concrete and they are still struggling to have the 37 percent there so especially for your green projects i think you could still find um uh, find a uh, reception for, for your ideas yes and you have mentioned uh, that for instance for the energy efficient renovation of uh, public buildings even the market-based uh, uh, solutions via an esco uh, are eligible so this is something that uh, doesn't need so much uh, uh, preparation, honestly, and uh, is a quick fix. 
and in line with the national uh, obligation uh, and uh, many stakeholders always ask uh, us how should we tackle uh, the energy efficiency of our public buildings well um, here is uh, an additional fund uh, for it uh, which is allowing it so uh, it is true um, 37 percent uh, of green obligation is a lot uh, so maybe uh, we should not uh, in the regional administrations and in the local ones underestimate uh, the volume of uh, money which is uh, uh, handed out and maybe submit a few project ideas too many is better than too little Yeah, that goes also for the area of circular economy. I think there is also a lot of things to do and the projects are um, potentially quite uh, uh, investment heavy. So uh, I think here also for for these areas where there is a huge uh, change needed. Uh, uh, so and a lot of investments and it's also bringing a lot of uh, jobs uh, in these areas. I think uh, there can be a lot done. And uh, if projects are in, in the pipeline, then they should be coming forward now. It's an excellent moment for that. I think this is a good uh, uh, closing. Uh, it is uh, 15.35 uh, uh, and uh, I think it is time for us uh, to thank uh, all our uh, speakers. Uh, thank you for the time uh, that you've taken to prepare. Thank you for sharing uh, your experience uh, and your knowledge and uh, thank you for uh, all the colleagues uh, that have been working invisibly or visibly uh, to prepare this uh, webinar. And of course, uh, thank you for the audience uh, who has joined us uh, in large numbers. Don't forget, uh, you will all receive an email with uh, the recordings of this webinar and the presentations uh, of all the speakers will be available uh, on the website uh, for follow up with the link. Okay, so um, we wish you all a good afternoon uh, from the Interreg Europe uh, Policy Learning Platform and uh, it is uh, goodbye from me. And goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.